Okay, yeah, that first week I had to re-record the whole lecture. That was fun. Um, or I should say the second week. No, Griffin, sorry. Sorry, a little dog interruption. So yes, yeah, so this week we had, or yesterday, yesterday morning, my husband gets a text from our daughter and son-in-law and they have um, another relative who needs a dog to find a new home. It's a three-year-old chocolate lab. So guess who has a new family member? This, <laughs> we have this big, big chocolate lab with us and he will probably join our lecture sometime today. So don't be surprised if you get a really big bark because he's got big boys. So sorry for any interruptions, but he's pretty sweet. Um, so today we are meeting for our OPA class, OT530, for our lecture. Um, I can share, um, maybe I'll just start with sharing my screen and oh, too many screens to choose from. Hold on. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. So we are going to start with a little discussion about the articles you guys read and some of you it's been a couple weeks probably since you read the article. Um, it's very informal if you know it's just kind of like our it was kind of our introduction with this class about looking over like some historical art articles and then I love how you all reflected on the article doing being becoming and just how that really spoke to you um, either in terms of your own um personal traits with um perfectionism or just like balancing out your life with your demands and your um time for reflection time for self just all the balancing out of doing being and becoming just really some great reflections really well written um so we're going to start out with that and then we're going to take a very in-depth look at um so um, some of the steps in our occupational activity analysis, including um, a really close look at the occupational, I have to look at the title of it, occupational profile template that we'll be using. Um, it's within the OT framework and we'll be looking at that quite extensively today. You'll be using all of these things for the rest of the semester as your either um, leading activities or evaluating um, like different things um, even within our groups class a lot of these things will spill over into how you run your groups and things that you look at in there so it'll be a really rich discussion about some of those things um, so first off does anyone um, from team watermelon have anything to share about this um, article, the occupation and activity over the history. Anybody from Team Watermelon? Do you remember what teams you were on? I guess I just thought it was interesting how um, over the decades the terms kind of fluctuated um, on which ones were used the most in different literature. Good. Kind of a dry article, wasn't it? I didn't like it as much as the doing being becoming one, but <laughs> That's why I didn't think everyone should read all of these. I'm like, they were in here, they were relevant, but they're really dry. So I thought I'd just share the wealth. Um, and anybody from team, um, I don't know if this was nectarine, I don't remember. Anyone from the article? an integrative review combined with semantic review. Just look familiar to anybody. Um, I think, was that for pineapples? I think, I think I had that one. It was very confusing because half of it was in like Swedish terms and then it was like comparing it to like our terms. So that was just like very hard to follow. Um, but just like one concept I thought was interesting was that they talked about how like there isn't a hierarchy between like occupation and activity. And I thought that was interesting because I feel like I kind of view them as like a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. so, so yeah, these are 
a little bit older articles. This one's from 2008. So just, re just um, maybe this article would be giving us an appreciation of where our profession is going more to look more in depth at that um, role of occupation and looking really at the value um, that people place on what they have for priorities and how we need to consider that within our treatment session. Um, so yeah, thank you, Emily. Um, then let's see. Our next one was Untangling Occupation by Team Kiwi. Anybody? Um, I had this one. I thought it was really helpful and like distinguishing between the two, it gave a lot of good like comparisons to terms we were familiar with. And I thought that really helped. Excellent. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, and our last one was, must be the nectarines. Um, purposeful activity. Anybody from Team Nectarine? Um, yes, I was part of that team and it kind of talked about how <clears throat> over the years people started to use activities and purposeful activities and occupations all kind of synonym, whatever that word is, Synonymous. all the same. And um, how they really shouldn't be used interchangeably because they are very different and the main emphasis was that activity really in itself has no meaning or purpose, but when you incorporate purposeful activity, it becomes meaningful to the client and then also could simulate an occupation. Um, and I felt like this article kind of did almost describe it as a hierarchy. So that's interesting. It's kind of the opposite of what the mm -hmm. other group had said. Um, and so just two different perspectives. This one just said you should always use purposeful activity and occupation over just a task or an activity. Mm -hmm. Yes, very good. Yeah, they used to use the term purposeful activity and not occupation. I feel like occupation is kind of taking over that term purposeful activity, kind of meaning of the same thing, but just the terms have changed over time. But yeah, just very, very impactful about considering that value and level of importance when you're addressing things with the client. And we're going to be talking a lot about that today. So that all ties in really well um, with our outline. So on your module for week three, um, I will pull it up as well. I don't, I didn't, the, there, there was a PowerPoint, but I did not like it. And I didn't recreate another PowerPoint. Um, so I just made an outline and it has a lot of notes embedded in it for your reference. I think it'll be more helpful than a PowerPoint because you can use it to refer back to um, when you are working on some of your, your um, occupation analysis assignments. Um, so we reflected on our articles. Um, so the next thing we're gonna do, like I mentioned, is talk about this OT, it's in the AOTA framework um, to sort through my papers because I have a bunch of them. Sorry, too many things here. Okay, um, so it is called the, OT, the AOTA occupational profile template. Um, I think I'll just pull that up so we can look at it first and then we'll do our discussion because it will really make sense um, if we pull that up and look at it first. So within all of the AOTA's frameworks that they've published, um, they've included this profile. Um, oops, I think I just, this one's a notes, sorry. Wrong profile, same profile, just one is one, this one is more narrative. Um, so this one kind of walks you through the process, but this profile template is actually the outline. So this would be something that you would want to use um, with clients. Um, it is a kind of provides an interview format. Um, we talked about two other interview possibilities yesterday in lab. This one is just a really basic 
um, kind of gets to the cuts to the chase of all of the things embedded in the occupational activity analysis. Um, so if you think about all of those things on the activity analysis, um, like the demands, um, the culture, the, um, you know, all of those things that we've kind of talked about a little bit on that analysis, um, things to consider, they're all kind of embedded into this questionnaire, which is not super long, it's just one page. Um, and it starts off with really just identifying the occupation, like, why are you here? And what do you really want to work on? It's kind of just like those basic let's cut to the chase and figure out what's going on and what we need to do. So the first one is why is a client seeking service? So that's really it narrows down your occupation right away. This is what's important. Um, and then it defines those occupations. What, you know, in what occupations does a client feel successful and what are the barriers? Um, what are the barriers based on their current medical situation or their current mental health situation or kind of those and kind of just defining that. Um, then it looks at like, what are your values and your interests? And so this is just a really nice, concise questionnaire to walk through all of those things. Um, the next one is, what is the client's occupational history? So like if you're working with someone who is maybe retired, um, they love to talk about their history and what they did as an occupation because that probably gave them so much value and maybe now they're feeling like they don't have as many occupations um so they really love to talk about their past so it's a great great thing to have them talk about what is your occupational history um if it's a child obviously you're probably not going to talk about their occupational history so you just have to consider the context um and then um from that just drawing on like how how that is relevant and maybe how they, how they are still connected to those occupations if they're retired or how it's influenced where they're at now. Um, their performance patterns would be the next one. Um, so how, like as you think of people aging, you think about um, maybe some muscle weakening or um, aches and pains or things that maybe have limited how they do their occupation now compared to when they were younger or maybe they have taken on a higher role and they have to do more duties that are more demanding. Um, just considering like what their occupation currently entails and how you're going to help them be fully functional. Um, the next part of this short template um, considers the environmental things and the context within their occupation. So they've kind of, you know, just really narrowed down the focus into just these five or six bullet points of the physical setting, the social, cultural, personal, temporal, and virtual. Um, and then they finish it off with the client's priorities. So we're going to talk a little bit about each of these a little bit more in our lecture today, but I kind of wanted you to go through this visual today or first. Um, within these is also two columns, one for what is like a positive or a supporting aspect of all of these. And then the other side are the barriers, like what is limiting you um, in your physical setting? What's limiting you in your social setting? What's limiting you culturally, personally, temporally, or virtually? Um, so just all on one piece of paper and just um, very concisely gets to all of those factors. Um, and then, like I said, ending up with their kind of priorities. So just a nice format to use for an interview with, especially with an adult or an older adult um, to kind of get right to the chase of what, what's going on. So that is in your OT profile, or excuse me, your OT framework. Um, and within that, I was kind of looking through that. I don't know if any of you have looked through it, but um, you're going to have time to, I keep kind of attaching it into each week because I feel like it's so relevant for everything that we do. And I always want it to be a resource and kind of get you to think of it as your go-to guide for things. Um, but there's a couple, there's a lot of tables at the end of it and table nine and 10 specifically really um, 
kind of break these down and they give nice examples and we'll be using those quite a bit in our homework lessons in the next weeks to come. So um, going back to our outline for this week. Um, yes, here we are. Um, so in when we're doing our occupational activity analysis that you guys will be working on in lab next week. Um, the first step is just to identify the occupation. So just like that template had um, the first question is like, what is your occupation and kind of breaks down um, that um, helping that client define like what what does successful look like for them or um, kind of what their major roles are. I have a short assignment for you to do at the end of lecture and that's just kind of considering what your roles are as a student as a family member, as a friend, as an employee, as whatever it is, you're going to fill out like your schedule and think about all your roles. And then how would those roles be impacted if you became ill or injured or something? And then how would your priorities change or would they change? Um, kind of reflecting on it as like a patient, like would their culture change? Well, no, their culture won't change. Would their rituals change? They probably don't want their rituals to change. Um, so just kind of thinking about that in the back of your mind as we go through our discussion today. Um, so that's right here where I kind of, we'll talk about it more at the end, but you're gonna, that's what your job will be doing is reflecting on everything that we talked about today in reflection of your schedule. Um, so step two in the activity analysis or occupational, I should say occupational activity analysis um, is finding relevance. Um, and so we just went through the occupational profile. Um, and that, like I said, is a really good tool for finding out all of those answers to all those questions. Um, and then um, looking at those environments and those contexts that surround their priorities will help you figure out um, priorities in your therapy session. Um, so the more you understand what's important and the more you can wrap your head around what it is that they feel their priorities are or their occupation is or their cultural values are, the more you'll be able to help them. So you just want to kind of get to know as much as you can about them. Um, so I think I jumped ahead of myself a little bit. Um, let me just look at my notes for just one second. Too many pieces of paper. Um, okay. So I think we already talked about all of that. So I'm just going to go ahead to um, talked about that. I just get ahead of myself, I tell you. Um, so the cultural context, um, the culture or the aspects that surround the client could be cultural, personal, temporal, or virtual. So we're going to go through what each of those means. Um, a cultural context, um, it influences kind of everything that they um, maybe prioritize in their life. If you think of culture, you think of like how you were brought up, like um, what was the culture of your family? Like were you, did you have like a certain ethnic background or a certain religious background that maybe influenced kind of how you did things in your house? Or maybe you had, um, like maybe part of your family culture was you were a hockey player team family, like everything you did focused around hockey or around ballet or around gymnastics or maybe around doing things on the water. Water sports were super important to your family. So you were always out on the river, always out on the lake. Like that would be considered part of your culture. Um, it wouldn't just be your ethnic background. Um, so then when you think about a client and you uh, think about their culture, some cultures would say, you know, I have to go to church on Sundays or like if I don't get to church or if I don't get to watch football or if I don't get to, you know, celebrate my birthday with a birthday cake or whatever it is, like 
I will be, you know, really upset. Or I, that's kind of my goal is to like make every Sunday football game happen or things like that. So like looking at their culture and looking at how that influences um, their priorities and then how to meet those within um, their occupation and how you're gonna help them get there. Um, sometimes cultures impact how um, we communicate or how we greet one another, um, different things. There's so many things you can learn about people that makes it really interesting. Um, but things to keep in contact or in consideration when you're working with a new client. Um, so that's a little bit about culture. Um, temporal is considered more of your performance and time. Um, and I was thinking of like temporal and thinking about COVID and how much COVID is going to change the way we do things already for you guys, obviously how you attend class. Um, how you just so many things ha have changed with because of COVID. Um, socially, like you, you know, everything has changed. Um, visiting nursing home patients. So I recently had the opportunity, not recently, prior to COVID, I had the opportunity to visit a couple people in a nursing home. And um, one of them was there for memory care and another one was there for a terminal illness. Um, and so I was able to kind of reflect on how they do things. I hadn't been in a nursing home in forever. Um, so um, it was just interesting to see the lack of occupation. This was before even considering teaching this class, but it was just really apparent the lack of occupation. So the clients, so many of them would just nap all day in a chair. Um, the only time they would get up and be active was in um, at mealtime. I think this nursing home was just really shoot, um, short on staff. So there wasn't any activities going on. And I just thought how limiting this was for these memory care patients and for this person who has terminal illness. Um, but then on top of it, then COVID happened and then they used to at least be able to have visitors. Um, and then when COVID came, there was absolutely zero visitors. Eventually they were able to set up like weekly Zoom visits with family members. But if you're thinking of like a memory care patient once a week to see their loved ones is not enough to hold on to those memories of who they are. Um, so just looking at that temporal context and how things in different stages of our life affect how we do things or affect um, just like, like I think about these people in the nursing home, how they'll never regain those memories or those connections because of COVID. I think that it's just very detrimental. Um, and then considering other contextual elements um, that might contribute to a person, um, I put like with their occupation and a result of an injury. So um, I forget where I was going with that statement. I think just considering like um, if they had an injury or medical condition, um, how would that like how would the context affect their ability to engage? So like with COVID, um, if they were doing, if they used to do construction or something that's very hands-on, if they were a surgeon, if they were whatever, like they wouldn't be able to go back to work necessarily if, just depending on their situation, but possibly if they had an illness or medical condition, they might be able to still work if it was a computer-based occupation where they could still do things. So considering like what's going on um, temporally or contextually that way. Um, virtual context, obviously before they wrote this, it wasn't COVID because they had some really, um, I've changed it obviously, but um, radio transmissions I left in there because I'm like, no one will know what a radio transmission is, but um, just the way that communication occurs. Um, now all communication is like Zoom or there's face conferencing, um, but how it might impact um, a client to be able to connect virtually. We're gonna talk about a client at the end of today and it will make more sense to put all this together. Um, 
social contexts. So we're still considering like what's most important for the client out of all of these contexts um, and just trying to figure out what's priorities for them. So we'll be looking at social contexts of like, do they have a spouse? Um, do they have children at home? Like what is the context of what they're returning to and what are their goals in relation to those social contexts and how do they support or limit their ability to participate? Um, another thing is performance patterns. Those would be like rituals, routines, habits, which can be good or bad. Um, but hopefully when you're interviewing your client um, and you're talking about their routines or their rituals or their habits or their roles, there'll be things that they really want to get back into and they often can serve as a motivator. Um, things like if they were in a social group or they were, um, they were in the habit of always getting up and taking their dog for a walk or they were always in the habit of um, eating really well or whatever their habits were, hopefully they were good habits and they will be things that they will strive to want to get back into. Um, those routines and things often keep us on a more engaged path, hopefully. Um, so just the, people will usually like to talk about these things and usually there are things that help them re-engage um, because of the way they've always done things. You hear that people say, well, I've always done it this way. And so it's like, okay, well, you've always done it that way. So let's try and get back to that. That can really serve as a strong goal, a good way for them to identify um, a strong goal areas. Like, well, how have you always done it? Let's try and look at how you've always done it and then we'll see what we can do. Um, so good way to really get them involved. Um, so this is our case example. This is Ryan. I think we talked about Ryan one other time and we got cut off. This was like maybe last week's lecture. Ryan was in there as well. Um, and we, our time limit ran out right in the middle of our discussion. And we were talking about um, his ability to engage in occupations. So I'm gonna read it. Um, and then we'll talk about these questions. So I want you to think about his um, ability or inability to engage in his occupations, the context that supports um, his ability to engage, like so social context or um, environmental context or virtual context, temporal context, like some of the things that we kind of just ran through. You can look, you can kind of be looking through those while I read it and consider what areas um, are either going to help him or be barriers, um, things that maybe we want to kind of like take notes on as we're talking with Ryan, like, ooh, this environmental context would be really helpful to like key in on or things like that. Um, so kind of be thinking about these things as I read it. Um, what performance patterns does Ryan exhibit? Performance patterns being those um, habits, routines, rituals, and roles. Um, so are there things as we're reading about Ryan that jump out at you like, oh, that's something that we could talk about. That's, that's a good area to think about for a goal. Um, here's, it's a kind of a repeat, but what's his social context like and what, or what social context is he likely to participate in? Can you picture him participating in any groups or particular settings? Um, and how likely is it that he could participate in virtual contexts, remote learning, or telehealth? So while you're thinking about those, I will um, go ahead and read this paragraph. Um, Ryan is a 17-year-old male who was involved in a motor vehicle accident six months ago. He suffered a severe head injury and was in a coma for two months after the accident. As a result, he's only able to use his left upper and lower extremities. He was right-hand dominant prior to the accident. He is also expressively aphasic, only able to yet nod yes or no. He has difficulty maintaining attention to tasks for longer than five minutes. He uses a wheelchair and has difficulty maintaining an upright position when leaning forward or reaching to his sides. He is cognitively impaired, only able to follow simple directions. He gets frustrated with people, especially when there's too much noise and he will hit or push people away from him. So you don't have a ton of information, but you have quite a bit of little 
snippets of information about him. So looking for shout outs from the group. Um, any contacts that would inhibit his ability to engage. So let's kind of breeze through these contexts. There's social, um, would that limit his ability to engage? Virtual, temporal. So like you could just always think of like right now it's COVID is kind of our biggest temporal thing going on. Um, cultural, any cultural things that would limit him from participating in his occupation um yeah those were our main our main context cultural temporal virtual and social i feel like i'd say for social because he easily gets frustrated with people Mm -hmm. That could definitely cause um, problems just with like the daily occupations of interacting with people and doing like group occupations. Yes, and he act definitely, and I feel like his ability or his frustration too with the noise would probably be something that would make social very difficult as well. Yes, good. Anybody else? I think along with that, just the kind of lack of ability to communicate, which I think we talked about last week too, but like mm -hmm. he can't really engage socially because he doesn't really have a way to engage socially. Mm -hmm. Can you, can anybody picture him in any kind of setting as a 17 year old? Like, do you think if school was open, um, since he's 17, he would probably be in school still. Um, so can you picture him in, and if it's okay if you can't, because if you can't, I can kind of paint a picture of what I think he would look like, but anybody have any experience with someone like him that they might be able to picture what kind of setting he might be involved or what kind of schooling he might be involved in? I think he'd probably end up having a one-on-one -on -one with a para. I know younger, but in elementary school, there is a student um, in my grade level that had cerebral palsy and wasn't able to communicate. And you're just not really able to participate. I mean, he had cognitive delays as well, mm -hmm. but I always remember there being a para with him like mm -hmm. throughout schooling. And I think as he becomes more like more like if he gangs cognition back that will be difficult for him mm -hmm. yes yes very good yeah and it's unfortunate sometimes those paras or teacher assistants um kind of get in between the client and the social peers and they end up being more of a barrier than an assistance in those social situations um he probably will experience some level of success with social in a special education setting with other peers that are also cognitively impaired since he is cognitively impaired. Um, so that small group setting, he, even though he doesn't communicate, I can picture other kids that don't really communicate well. Maybe, maybe they can't even consistently nod yes or no. Um, but they still get just as much enjoyment out of watching the other kids maybe or um, different things. So I could picture him being limited that way culturally, but that also being a location that might facilitate him socially. It kind of looks at like, well, he's not gonna be able to participate with maybe typical peers. Um, so that would be a barrier or his abilities would be barriers, but he maybe would be in the right context of a special education setting might be seen as more successful and maybe the demands are lower and his um, maybe the setting could be quieter and maybe things that um, help him regulate could be in place and things like that could be added to his setting so that he can participate. Um, yes. 
Um, anything else? So like he's got limited use of his extremities. He's got limited balance. He's got limited trunk control. Um, he's in a wheelchair. Any other contexts that seem relevant? I feel like environmental context would also be on here, but it's um, it would be one that we would consider. It just isn't listed on here in my notes, but that would be another one. How would environmental context um, be something we'd want to talk about or think about? I know there's so many new terms. So that's why I'm trying to apply them to a actual person because it's so many terms and I didn't make them all up. So I just don't want to be the, the bad guy. Um, so environmental contexts would be things like um, fit his physical skills and his physical, like his body, um, his ability to move, his physical skills, like those would all be obviously very limited. So those would go under his, those limitations because um, he's not physically able to engage in things that other kids his age would do. He's not able to drive a car. He's not able to play sports or engage in activities that they might do in class for both physical and cognitive reasons. So environmental would also be a limitation. Environmental and um, just that physical skills area as well. So that would be all areas that you'd wanna talk about with him as like, well, how, you know, or talk about with his family about setting goals to kind of improve on all of those contexts and ways that he could engage more. So with Ryan, um, how likely do you think he could participate in virtual contexts such as remote learning or telehealth in this COVID time? I don't see that going very well for him because again, he can't sit upright very well. Um, he has limited cognitive ability and then also he can't access it himself. So he really would have to have like a parent or a family member with him at all times if he did want to do that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you, Mercedes. Um, yeah, just the whole, we, um, so right now, even before COVID, telehealth was kind of taking off. And I feel like a number of you will probably end up working in a telehealth setting um, with or without COVID. It feels like there's so many people like in remote areas or areas where they can't staff enough occupational therapists and they're ending up providing service delivery through telehealth. Um, so looking at what kind of clients would be good candidates for telehealth and which ones absolutely need to come in for therapy. Um, so you're looking at that virtual context. And yeah, that would be a big challenge for him with his cognitive limitations, as well as his motor limitations and communication limitations. Um, unless a lot of those change, that would be really challenging for him to participate in. So yes. Um, so then, I wanted to, to go through, I have a couple more things on our module handout. Um, to go back to this. Um, so there's a couple documents I included here and they really have just drawn out of the framework. Um, I really just copied and pasted them into separate documents to talk about performance patterns and um, and the occupational profile. So this one on the occupational profile is just there for your reference and it just is like a narrative talking about how to use the occupational profile um, because we cannot, I don't know, I'm jumping, jumping ahead. Um, never mind. Um, so it is just a way, it just talks you through all of the uses and ways to use the occupational profile. So it's really just there for your reference, but I did take it directly out of that OT framework. Um, and we're gonna jump to the performance patterns. <clears throat> um, and this is just a little bit more detail about, this copy didn't seem like it came out all that well. 
um, about those details in um, our demands and our um, our client factors and our um, activity demands that we look at in our occupational activity analysis. Um, so it just kind of goes through and talks about all of those areas. Um, so again, it's, it's more for your reference. Um, just glancing through it. Um, so by going through all these details, um, you're just getting that more complete picture of your client and setting goals and working on your priorities together. So I am just putting, I'm just going to leave that there for your reference. So I mentioned that you'll have a little homework to do. It is not going to take you long at all. Um, it's really just for your reflection. I don't need it turned in. Um, it's just like a copy of like a blank schedule. Um, and then I'm going to have you just generally kind of fill in um, how you use your time during the day and then kind of color code or use a different marker or something um, to kind of indicate like this time every day, you know, is my role as a student and this time is my role as a friend and this is my role. This is the time I use in my week that is um, as a daughter or a son or a brother or sister or a mother or a father or whatever your roles are. And then um, how would those roles look if you became ill or weren't able to, to carry out your roles? Like would your priorities change or um, would somebody else be able to take over your roles? Or kind of think about them like, um, if something happened that you couldn't participate in those, would they still be a priority? And what kind of influences your priority? Is it your cultural background of your family? Is it your um, um, environment? Is it your social world? Like what kind of influences those roles and how are they important to you? Um, what are the physical environments in your occupation? If something happened, could they be altered? Um, what are the social environments that influence your performance? Um, cultural beliefs, standards, all of these things. So there's, it's just for your reflection as you like start to think about a real client that you might be working with and then thinking about having these conversations with them. Um, but first I want you to think about them for yourself and how your roles are affected by all of these contexts that you, um, that you just really live in that you never really think about until there's a problem. And then when there's a problem, it's like, okay, now what do I do? And are these things important? And how, why are they important? So it's just a good exercise to go through and then um, have your own self-reflection as you get to know clients that you work with and you can think about it through their lens. So I don't need this turned in. It's just a reflection, just a way to kind of develop those interview skills and think about um, what someone else will be going through. So that is all I have for you today. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? I have a question. Yes. Um, it doesn't revolve this class, but do we have class on Friday? Thank you, Michaela. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. Michaela is keeping me on track. I love it. Um, so this Friday, um, we were asked to not use the lab um, because they needed it for some testing situation for something with Western. Um, so I told Dr. Schaefer we would be happy not to have lab on Friday. So for OT571, there will be no class on Friday, September 25th. So you have Friday off. So I hope you guys have an awesome weekend. I will be doing lecture on Thursday afternoon at 2.15 and I won't start before 2.15. I'm writing in my calendar right now. Um, 
And um, so if, I will either see you at lecture at 2.15 or you can watch it um, in the recording thereafter. So I hope you guys have a great rest of your week and I will either see you on Thursday or I will see you on Monday. All right. Quick question. Guys, yes. I'm sorry. Um, you have like a week one um, article review as an assignment. Do you want us to just submit our like copy and paste our reflection and put that in there for the article oh. or? For the articles, um, I was thinking, I'm still on my screen share, so I'm just gonna pull it up. And I didn't know if this would work or not since Canvas is new to me and it's new to you guys. And so I wanted to kind of see if it would work to do it this way, to use this discussion section. Um, so if you went into your article, um, it seemed to me that you would be able just to type in here, to type a reflection and then have it um, um, just shared with the group. So then you could post your reply and it would go. So I kind of started it with just putting in here to contribute to the discussion, um, any comments or main ideas and just keep it really informal. So this is the articles you're referring to, right? Um, I was looking under the assignment tab and then you have week one article. I just didn't know if we were supposed to submit anything under that or if just the discussion post was. I think just the discussion post. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, some of this stuff is um, in here from the previous class and sometimes I overlook it because there's so many layers. Um, but this one does say 2020. Um, so yeah, this one was just in response to that article and these are your groups. So yeah, if you had um, whichever article you read, if you want to just um, just try out that platform of using discussions and going in and clicking on your article and then typing a reply in the reply box and then you can share it and then all of any main points about the article will be listed below. So we'll just practice. It's more of a practice of using that format of discussion and just getting familiar with all the options we can use on Canvas um, as we do activities like this. So yeah, if you want to just have a bullet point, a phrase, it doesn't have to be a long reflection, just shout out any main points that you might have from your article would be great. Thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so for 571, we don't, we're not going to be meeting on Friday, but do we have anything we need to do or is it just like totally off, don't do anything? I think I'm just gonna give you the whole Friday off. Beautiful. Work? Thank you, yes. Awesome. <laughs> it should be Oktoberfest. Speaking of cultural um, practices and cultural backgrounds, um, we all know Oktoberfest was canceled, but if you lived somewhere other than La Crosse, you might not experience the culture of Oktoberfest. So it's just another filter to put on someone that you're getting to know. Like, are you from La Crosse? Well, then you know about Oktoberfest. So you'll have to just have your own Oktoberfest celebration in safety, socially distanced with masks. So enjoy. I Anybody have else? one other question. Yes. <clears throat> so looking at the discussions, when you pulled that up, yes. um, all of the groups replied, but we I can't see anyone else's I can't see oh, even what I we wrote. I can't see anybody's either. Gosh. So you can see on the side that it says like each group responded, but for whatever reason, I can't look at them. Huh. I will go in and see if I can figure that filter out. I just wanted to let you know. Oh, sorry. It's really echoey in here. <laughs> I can see them. <laughs> you can? Awesome. Okay, well, I can't. So I'm going to do a little investigation and see if we can all see them. So I will check that out. All right. I think Anybody it only else? Works, I think it only works for the group that you're a part of. Okay. That makes sense. Maybe. So, like, because you're not in our, like, groups, uh -huh. you probably can't see our replies. Okay. But, like, in our group, like we can go and see everyone that replied in our group. Okay. Hmm. 
All right, it will take a little investigation on my part to see if I can clarify or clear that up so that next time if we use it again, um, it's more clear to everybody because that would be helpful. We don't want to just only know about our article if there's more than one. Okay, anybody else? I have a question about a 570 thing. Yes. Um, so I got your, or we got your email about doing like the journals for like our self um, reflection throughout the semester. Yes. Um, and we've done the first three personal inventories, but it says that there's like a UWL professional development one that you'll be giving us. Um, is that something that's to come in the future classes or should we find that ourselves? Um, I thought it was posted, but um, I will make sure it is um, posted. It's something that you just want to review before you meet with your professor or before you meet with your advisor. Um, I might have missed it too. That's okay. I can go in and make sure it's in there because it could have been something that I thought I had put in there and I, I'll just make sure it's in there. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, anybody else? Okay, you guys have a great rest of your week and I'll see you either Thursday or Monday. Bye.